Welcome to session number five. For our three sessions this morning, uh, we're looking at how our service to the world plays out in different aspects. Um, depending on what you already know, some of the sessions might have to be sidetracked, but we'll see how we go as per usual. So I want to start our first one this morning in Matthew chapter 25. Right, it's quite a long passage from verse 31 to 46. So one of those people who said they were awake, can you find the microphone and read it for us? <laughs> Chapter 25, verse 31 to 46. The final judgment. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glory, glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on the right, Come you who are blessed. By my Father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you come to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, and you fed, fed you, or thirsty, and gave you drink? And when did we see you a stranger, and welcome you, or naked, and clothe you? And when did we see you sick, or in prison, and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did to it, did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. 41? 46. 46. Sorry, continue. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared from the devil for the devil and his angels. For I was a hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me, naked, and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And those will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Radio. A lot of things going on there. Um, I didn't pick this passage to focus necessarily on the judgment between the sheep and the goats and what that is all about. But if you want to ask a question about that, uh, you can. I don't guarantee a good answer though. The point of this is how we understand our service to people around us in light of our service to God. We're looking at God calling us to a life of service, of worship. And yet here in this passage, Jesus says, well, to serve me, you should have been serving the least of these. When you give them what they need, that is indeed service to me. If you look at the examples that he gives, there's some very basic needs of humanity. Is anyone aware of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? It's the one where people like to draw Wi-Fi at the bottom because that's more important than even food or shelter or company or self-esteem. Do you want to draw it, Sam? Is that what you said? I'm sure that's what I heard.
The point of this, though, is the things that Jesus describes here are the real basic needs of humanity. To be fed, to be clothed, to have shelter, to have someone care about you, to visit you. So if you look at the two examples, hungry and you gave me food, thirsty and you gave me drink, a stranger and you welcomed me, naked and you gave me clothing, sick and you took care of me, in prison and you visited me. This is really basic stuff. This is not some grand plan, some great spiritual acts that you have to do. This is simple caring for your fellow human being. And it's in this that Jesus says, you have served me. So how then do we understand this call of life, call in all of life? What is it that we should be doing? In Luther's time, those who were in the monasteries who dedicated their life to some religious calling viewed themselves as being better, as more serving God than those who just lived their life. And yet here, there's no mention of even praying for me, no mention of of talking to me about theology at three o'clock in the morning, which I believe some of you were doing. This is real, simple, earthly stuff. Food, drink, clothing, someone to care for you, someone to visit you, someone to welcome you when you're a stranger. This is our service as a priesthood, the royal priesthood that we talked about. This is part of our service. Yes, the aspect that we talked about yesterday of declaring the mighty acts of God and of interceding on behalf of the people is certainly important. But here Jesus reminds us that this simple human needs are also important. And we see here reflected uh, what we call the two kinds of righteousness. Now, someone who was here last year Can you explain to the rest of the group what's going on with the two kinds of righteousness? Hayden, I saw some movement. You want to come out the front? (laughs) I don't know. This is the action that Guntars does for the two kinds of righteousness. (laughs) Except his arms are a bit bigger than mine. (laughs) So So you've got a vertical arm? The vertical arm is um, the righteousness that God gives to us. So it's coming down in a vertical direction. And then the horizontal arm is when we uh, show that righteousness to one another through good works. That'll do. Even, Even the position of your hands is important in that. So you're receiving from God, receiving Christ's righteousness, and spreading that out to the world. So here, when Jesus talks about serving your neighbour in this way, he says this is completely linked. The service out in the world, even this real basic stuff of giving someone who's thirsty a drink, is intrinsically tied into your standing before God. And we understand that it is because God gives us his righteousness that we can act in righteousness to those around us. And this is something we do every single day of every single week of our life as a Christian. So the most righteous act, when you understand it in that way, is not showing up to church an hour early so that you can sit right up the front, which I know all of you do. Our most righteous act is not necessarily serving in the church, playing the keyboard, singing, doing the Bible readings. The most righteous act, even on a Sunday morning, perhaps, is those who look after the tea and coffee, those who sweep up the leaves. In my church, by the time they swept all the way around and get back to the front again, there's more leaves. It's the simple, basic stuff in life. I have the microphone up here.
So Mary and Martha, apparently. Oh, just so you know, you're talking about you know the service, you know the 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 tidying up, the cleaning, the providing food. Yep. Um, but what of Jesus turning that on its head with the whole Mary Martha thing? Which which one of these was Mary and which one was Martha? True, good point. If you're doing this without already having received from the Lord, what are you doing? That is a question that I want you to answer. <laughs> you're earning salvation. Earning salvation. Yeah, so I've lost that answer. Go on, I'm just thinking for myself. It's my own stuff. God's taken out a picture and my heart's rubbish. So. Works righteousness and it will never, ever be good enough. So the most important thing is to receive from God. And then having received God's righteousness, when you give, you're giving out of the abundance that God has given you. And it doesn't have to be majestic. It can be all this simple stuff. And there's another point hidden in there. We'll see if we can work it out. When you receive from Christ, what are we... What are you actually receiving? Talk about his righteousness, that's what I've been saying. What is he giving you? His righteousness? <laughs> what was in the reading this morning? A vine. Life. Life. Yeah, life. Your life flows from what God gives you. Without that, we could say that you are dead. Where else do we use this idea of being dead without Christ? Dead to sin. Dead in sin, dead to sin, one or the other. You see how it all all fits together. The life of abiding in the vine, receiving the righteousness from Christ, serving the world around you based on the abundance of what Christ has given you. Otherwise, it is. You are dead. What you're giving is merely from yourself. And in fact, it's really nothing at all. And yet the people who were doing this giving in our passage in Matthew, did they know that that's what they were doing? No. How does that work? Surely when Jesus tells us how to love our neighbour, then we know that when this is on what, what I'm doing right now is to love my neighbour and I can tick that box. Anyone? <laughs> Can I have a crack at it? Well, I guess it's sort of like, um, because it says that Jesus has blessed us and we've been given that righteousness. And then rather than um, maybe if you like are trying to earn that righteousness, you might think about all the things that you need to do to do it. Whereas if you've been given that righteousness, it just isn't kind of natural overflow. And it's like, if you if you love someone, you're not like, oh, I'd better, like, do this because then, like, that's all. Like, you're not necessarily thinking that, oh, I have to do that so that they'll like me or that it's the right thing to do. You just do it because it's what you want to do. This, this is the act I have to do to show you that I love you and I'll do that for that reason instead of that I do and it just happens. Luther says, if everyone served his or her neighbour, then the whole world would be filled with divine service. Is that phrase divine service used a little bit differently. But that's the whole, the whole point of where we started with this word service. To serve means to worship. 
If everyone served his or her neighbour, then that is God serving the world. Can you see how then Sunday morning, not Maccas, but the two encounters, <coughs> do you see how that ties in to every day of the week? But as God serves us, we receive his righteousness through those two peaks, those two encounters. We then serve our neighbour and in that way, God through us is bringing his grace, his love, his mercy to the whole world. Sometimes it's easy to forget that all that we have, not just our salvation, but all that we have is a gift from God. If you think about the creed, we confess three different articles. I think sometimes we forget about the first article of the creed, that God is our maker. God is the one who provides us with everything we need. I'm going to read uh, from the small catechism, just to remind you of Luther's explanation to that first article. I believe that God has created me together with all that exists. God has given me and still preserves my body and soul, eyes, ears and all limbs and senses, reason and all mental faculties. In addition, God daily and abundantly provides shoes and clothing, food and drink, house and farm, spouse and children, fields, livestock and all property, along with all the necessities and nourishment for this body and life. God protects me against all danger and shields and preserves me from all evil. And all this is done out of pure fatherly and divine goodness and mercy, without any merit or worthiness of mine at all. For all of this I owe it to God to thank and praise, serve and obey him. And then, of course, the final sentence, this is most certainly true. So we're reminded here that the Father who made the world still sustains his world. All these simple, basic things that we're talking about are good gifts from our Father. His Ten Commandments that he gave are not some arbitrary list of rules that you must abide by, but God's blueprint for his creation. And housed within those Ten Commandments is in fact all that we see and do. The commandment to not murder your neighbour means learning to love the goodness of human life, of human health. The commandment to not steal means learning to understand the finances of work, of property, of not cheating your neighbour in any way. Learning not to covet, perhaps the hardest one of all in our affluent Western society, means learning to appreciate the beauty and entertainment that is around us for what it is, things which are passing away, which do bring gratitude and contentment, but are not the things that will last forever. So when we look at all these things and are reminded that it is in fact God who is the giver of all of it, and I think this idea that our life of service to the world is not just proclaiming God's mighty acts, which is certainly part of it, but indeed what we've read in Matthew 25. We can see that it is all tied together. God the Father is at work giving this world all that it needs, spiritual and physical, and God works through his people, through you, the royal priesthood. When we misunderstand that, when we tie that in, this idea of God giving through creation, when we tie that into salvation, we can run into a couple of traps. One is that how good a Christian we are is reflected in how much stuff we have. We call that prosperity theology. So those who are thirsty, those who are hungry, those who are without clothing, those who are in prison and need a visitor, those who are sick, the need taken care of, clearly aren't Christian then. If they haven't got all these good things from God, the conclusion then is that their salvation must be lacking. And that's a confusion 
of the first article of the creed, confessing that God is our creator, and the second article, confessing that Christ is our saviour. But their duty to understand the distinction there, that it's not because we are saved, because we are good enough, that God blesses us. God blesses this whole world through his people. This gift of righteousness that we receive happens first before we serve the world around us. It's too easy, though, to get it back to front. So for so many people, even Christians in churches in Australia, they look at perhaps their finances, their health, and they question their salvation. They question their faithfulness to God. If only I was more faithful, if only I did more good works. And again, as we reflect on this Matthew passage, it's back to front. Those who did these good works didn't know they were doing them. They knew that they received blessings from God, both righteousness and salvation, and God's good gifts of creation. And that in reflecting that love of God, they indeed served their neighbour. When you have that confusion, you can also turn into legalists, that you must serve your neighbour. As a Christian, you must do all these things. And again, that's got it back to front. As a Christian, you will, because the Holy Spirit is at work in you and through you. But that's not what defines you. Your salvation in Christ defines you as a Christian. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with lots of work to do in serving our neighbour, lots of ways to understand how God uses us to serve in this world. Before I go on to sort of the next section, I suppose we should have some questions about really anything now. Anything. Well, within some bound of reason, Jacob. <clears throat> Did you actually have one? Or are you just threatening me? Okay. Pastor Josh, I have a question. Yes, Pastor Sam. In, um, in that Matthew reading, the uh, people who did the good works didn't know that they did them. Mm -hmm. And the people who uh, were condemned didn't know the good works were available for them to do. Yes. They didn't know they didn't do them. Yes. Does that mean if we know we've done good works... Where do you fit? That we've... <laughs> that it's become works righteousness? Not necessarily, because Jesus here is telling them what they've done. It's when it's the focus. So you might recognise, not necessarily at the time, but you right, might recognise actually that was definitely God blessing this person through me in some way or another. But when you recognise that after, after you've already done it, then that's what's going on in this text. When you see it as an opportunity and don't do it, then that is the opposite of works righteousness. That's your own sin condemning you. When you see it and do it, that's the Holy Spirit at work convicting you of the good things you should be doing. It's not that you see it and go, this is what I need to do to be a Christian the fact that you see it in the first place is because you are already a Christian. That God has already told you the good things that he would have you do. doesn't mean we always do it. We are still sinners in this world. Is that enough of an answer for you? Good. Any other questions even about that passage? Does anyone remember the question I asked you last night? Apparently I did. What does what look like? I've forgotten the question I asked, so. Yeah. 
Did anyone come up with any answers? Jacob did. Excellent. Are you going to say what I've just told you now? I wasn't listening well enough to say that. Um, <laughs> I would say to be a royal priesthood is to, well, well it is similar to serve, but it's to be the body of Christ. Um, that he has come into us, and that is through word and sacrament, and therefore we are his body to go out into the world um, and to basically be Christ in the world. Yeah, but what does that look like? So that looks like us doing the very actions that Christ did, and we see that in the first apostles that went out, that they were sent out, well, they were sent out in pairs, um, and they did the same sorts of works as, as what Christ did. So they went out teaching, um, primarily, um, teaching about Christ and the salvation that there is in Christ. Um, they went out um, serving people, um, providing them food and providing um, healing to them um, and providing for their, their basic needs, which is what you were, were talking about, obviously, in this session um, with the, the sheep and the goats. Um, yeah. They were taking, I suppose you could bring it back to Genesis and say they were starting to take ownership of the land, as, of, the, of the, the world as well. They were seeing that they were responsible for the people um, that were around them because God had placed them in their, in their world around them um, and they were responsible for all of, all of creation and so therefore they were actually taking responsibility of it mm -hmm. rather than taking what is a more common concept of ownership where when you own something you can do whatever you want with it. Very good. Did everyone hear all that? Excellent. I'll, I'll tell you later. Did anyone else do some thinking along those lines? In all your hours awake, not sleeping? Did anyone think more practically in their own life? Perhaps you can reflect now, now that you've heard this Matthew passage on perhaps some opportunities that have happened in your own life to do these things. Looking back, obviously, looking back perhaps at missed opportunities. Meryl. Um, I think sometimes um, having a... Um, I guess in the Christian mindset, we can be a bit overactive in our minds about whether we're doing the right thing or not because um, we don't want to do the wrong thing. Um, in, the, in this passage, you know, those people that didn't know that they were doing the right thing, like that's, that's awesome, but it seems to, you know, be, well, at least in my life, a rare thing. Um, because as Christians, we're called to obey God and do all these things. So we actually have to be consciously thinking about doing those things because not out of, to, to, you know, for, for salvation, but just because that's what God calls us to. So we are going to be actively thinking and, and doing those things, and that's still good, I reckon. Mm. Um, and, and I think that um, the Holy Spirit is very good, or he has been very good in my life and probably everyone else's at convicting us at those times where we should do something, and it's awesome when we do, and then those times where we don't, you're like, missed opportunity. But but it's I, I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's um, um, for anyone else that's a bit like me and, and tends to overthink things, um, if, if your heart is to serve God, because that's what we're called to do, um, you know, look for those opportunities. If the Holy Spirit's prompting you, then go for it. Um, and, and obviously seek his forgiveness when, when you miss that. But, um, yeah, I guess, I don't know, I wouldn't want to get over-anxious or worried about whether I was consciously or unconsciously serving him because um, we're, just, we're just called to, so just, just do it. If that is helpful, I hope, and not too rambly. One of the things you get out of, out of those who didn't do these good works is you get the impression that they were focusing on the bare minimum. How many times did I need to feed the hungry to pass? How many times do I need to just give a drink to someone to pass? Surely if you'd told me how many I needed to do and pointed out, I would have done them 
uh, would have been good enough. But the ones who did do these things weren't even thinking about how many. They were just living the life God had called them to live, living in that mercy, knowing that when they fail, there is still that forgiveness. And when God leads them to serve in that way, that it is to God's glory, not to their own. We sort of touched on something. Yes, Levi. So one of the other ways, the practical ways you can see it is striving to live out the Ten Commandments. We've already got repentance and forgiveness. So strive to live out the Ten Commandments in their practical ways. So uh, you've got parents practically as a Christian, you, you wanted them. So if they say, clean up the dishes or ring me up once a week, you actually do that. That's a, a physical, it's a practical way of us living out that Christian life, that priesthood. Um, also, not for us, but dying well back in the day. Uh, so the Christians got persecuted and rather than renounce their faith or back down on what they, on Jesus' teachings, they preferred to die. And there was a case where there was a plague going through town and the Christians stuck around and did the, the deed of helping others who were sick and many Christians died, that got the plague and died, but they still saw that as a, a valuable, worthwhile thing to live out the gospel, helping the sick, um, proclaiming the gospel and dying with a hope that there we don't stay dead. <laughs> with the knowledge of salvation and the gift of eternal life in Christ. Yes, that's what you meant. So they were willing to go visit the sick to give them food and drink and clothing, even at risk of their own life. Put to your neighbour first in that regard. The one thing we did touch on, sort of, is that God's law speaks to us in different ways. Now, some of you who've been to different conferences and teaching would immediately know what I'm talking about. That is the three functions of the law. Yes, a few, a few nodding heads. Yes, Pastor Sam knows. <laughs> three functions of the law. Put your hand up if that's an unfamiliar phrase. All right. Put your hand up if you feel like explaining it to those who just had their hand up. Otherwise, I'll do it. You know, Josh, it is, Pastor Josh, do it. It's my job. Three functions of the law. And the, the reason I use the word functions instead of uses is that we're not the one who use it. It's the law doing what it does. So the first curb is curb or fence. What does a curb or a fence do? It delineates. It stops you going where you shouldn't go. So the law in that function prevents you from doing evil. One of the very simple outworkings of this first function of the law is through the state. You see a speed limit sign. The law is telling you what you should be doing. And unless you ignore it, you don't break the speed limit. Isn't that right, Isaac? Is it right? Yes. Thank you. Second function of the law, which I just sort of morphed into there. No, that's the third. Mirror. What does a mirror do? You get to look at yourself and see how pretty you are. In fact, when it's the law being a mirror, you see how ugly your sin is. It shows you the times you have not fulfilled God's law. This is the one that convicts you of your sin, drives you to repentance. The third one, Jacob jumped the gun with this before, guide or signpost. What does a guide or a signpost do? It shows you the way to go. So this is the one 
we've mostly been talking about this morning. That God's law tells us what it looks like to live as a Christian, shows us the way to go. But at the same time, the law always accuses. As it shows us the way to go, we invariably realise times in the past where we haven't gone the right way. As the law points out the boundaries in the curb, it invariably reminds us of times in the past where we've crossed that boundary. So the law always accuses, even as it has both these other functions. Are you right there, Sam? We want the Latin. The Latin? Lex Semper Accusat. Why do you want the Latin? Do you want me to spell that? They're words, Levi. <laughs> you can ask Levi later how to spell Lex Semper Accusat. And he will come and ask me. The Latin, because all good theology is done in Latin. And, and all really good theology is done in German. No. It used to be that if you studied theology, it was in Latin. That, that was it. Yeah. Not so anymore. So do you see how this passage shows us the law both in that third function, in that this is what it looks like to be a Christian, but also in the second, that it reminds you of times where you haven't done those things. It is accusing you of your sin. Where do we turn at that point? We see that our righteousness to others isn't good enough. Jesus. We don't do more of this and hope we get there. We go back to this. Receiving the grace and mercy and forgiveness from Jesus. Ready to live another day. Perhaps with our eyes a bit more open to the opportunities so that we can serve in the way God calls us to serve. The three functions of the law. Um, I think it was Jacob who tried to tell me it was three uses of the law. The reason I don't like the word uses is it implies that we are the ones in charge of the Holy Spirit. We are the ones in charge of how God's word works in speaking his law. It is the spirit, the law itself, that operates in these different ways. All of them at the same time, really. So three functions of the law, curb, mirror, guide. Pretty much brings us to the end of session one, unless there's another couple of questions. And by session one, I mean session five. Session one for today. If there's no questions, you can have a 15-minute break. And we'll come back at 10 past. Ready for some more.